Welcome to Cindy's Library. This is Cindy and today I'm going to talk about what I have read in the first half of April since I have a bit of a stack here. So let's get started with that. So first of all, guys have seen the news. This is the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson arrived. And I have an individual review for this one. Try to remember to link it below. But suffice it, to say, but suffice it to say, I loved it. Highly recommended, especially for fans of fairy tales. Let's see, I finished Silas Marner by George Eliot. This is the second time I have read it. I have read it and enjoyed it even more the second time than the first. Uh, Silas, he is a tragic figure. Uh, we start off by learning uh, where he is now and what happened to him to make him such a sad figure. Uh, he is a miser since he feels gold is all he has left in his life. Not quite as bad as Scrooge. He's not actively cruel, but it's all he really cares about. Until one day all of that changes. Wonderful story. Love it. Let's see. Well, oldie but goodie. First Test by Tamara Pierce. This is the first book of the Protector of the Small series. So, um, let's see. Isn't too long after the Immortal Wars, ten years after King Jonathan has proclaimed that girls can become knights, thanks to Alana, if you want to read about her, you can read the Lioness Quartet that starts everything off. But, uh, Keldry of Mindelin, nicknamed Kel, 10 year old girl, she wants to be a knight. So, since there's this proclamation, she is allowed to, in spite of all the conservative uh, faction at court that are not really a fan of girls becoming knights. They say that the lioness used her gift to cheat, that she's goddess blessed, so of course she can do whatever. Well, Kel wants to become a knight in spite of all of that. Yeah, but this first fear in particular is rather important for her since even though Kel herself doesn't feel it is fair, the only way the current uh, guy in charge of the in charge of training the pages, Lord Weldon, will let her there is if she is on probation for the first year. Uh, he's not the only one who isn't happy she is there, unfortunately. Fortunately, she does manage to eventually start making some friends. And we'll leave it at that. I like Kel, though, because, well, as Alana says with regards to Kel much, much later, She's just so ordinary. It's perfect that way. Okay, let's see. What else have I read? Ah, yes. Becoming Madeline. Biography the, a biography of the author of A Wrinkle in Time by her granddaughters, Charlotte Jones, Vocalis, and Lena Roy. So... This is not the most extensive of biographies. The main part of the book ends with the publication. 
basically of a wrinkle in time. And there's an epilogue that covers things after and such, but there's only maybe 10 pages at most in here. But it's a very interesting journey going with Madeline on her getting to the point of getting A Wrinkle in Time published. Um, so interesting things, pictures, um, the grade at areas are snippets from her actual journals or letters or things like that. So that is interesting. I would say this is perfect for any kids that enjoy A Wrinkle in Time. They want to know more about the author. Glad I read it. Oh, let's see, next I read or at least listened to Othello. Um, let me see. The more the tragedy the Tragedy of Othello, The More of Venice, Shakespeare. And when they say tragedy, they aren't kidding. Um, you have Othello, who is in love and marries his true love, Desdemona, and they are perfectly happy. He's also successful in fighting wars um, on behalf of the city of Venice. So life is great. In fact, it's too great. They were never entirely um, told anything convincing by Iago about why he hates Othello so much. And he hates Othello all the more for his success, of course. But what is clear is that Iago wants to ruin Othello. And he spends the entire play doing just that. It's a really sad thing to see. And well, we do get um, some resolution and that secrets are found out. Um, everything is put, order is restored, things like that. <sighs> well, it wouldn't be a Shakespeare play without lots of lives ruined, sadly. A Shakespeare tragedy, I should say. And in some tragedies, we do have uh, more comic scenes interspersed, especially at the beginning. And not that there aren't a couple comic characters here. But overall, it keeps the same tone of impending doom, doom pretty much through all of it. It's still well worth the read or listen. So, see, I also read Olive, and this is by Dinah Maria Mullock Craik. And I read it as an ebook, but loved it so much that this is what I found. It really isn't as long as this might make you think it is. I mean, look at those margins and spacing there. Look at the size of the type there. Used to a lot more type on a page in many cases. But Olive is a wonderful story that I absolutely loved. And there are several things going on in it. Um, Olive, she, well, starts basically with her birth. Um, her, in the Scottish Highlands. Her mother is there in a place, I won't say it's a tiny place per se, but it's a smallish place compared to where they go later. 
Um, I think it's in her husband's family. And so that's why she's there. Well, he is gone off probably in India. I'd have to double check. But he is off with the army doing things. Or, yeah, pretty sure it's the army. And part of the reason for that is either he or his father quarreled with the rest of the main family. So soldiering is what he can do to get a bit of stability. And he does get some stability through that, but he is not present for Olive's birth. But it is the nurse who first discovers that Olive she has some sort of deformity with her spine, so she'll have something of a hump. And Olive is brought up carefully and to not know much about that. And of course, it's rather devastating to her when she does figure out things and that society won't view such things favorably and she thinks therefore her chances of marriage and love are pretty much non-existent at that point which is so sad but she decides to make the best of her life after her father's death which of course uh, lots of money complications there now her mother does have a tiny bit, I think, but more would be better in their circumstances, even if they live simply. So Olive, she decides she is going to become an artist, since no one really cares what an artist looks like. And she does and finds a lot of fulfillment between that and taking care of her widowed mother who is delicate. And uh, eventually she and her mother move to this town where there's this guy who seems very disagreeable. Uh, let's just say they end up having a lot of religious discussions. Um, when I'd heard about this book before, I had heard about how uh, it was an interesting portrayal of disability and differentness during the Victorian era, and it is, it gets full marks for that. Uh, and it's interesting also that Olive actually tries to make something a and does make something of her life in spite of all of that. She finds a place for herself. What I did not realize was how many religious themes were in this book. And that was what really got me, I have to say. Olive is just a truly good person trying to do what's right and by those around her and just trying to make the best of her life that she can and she is amazing so loved 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 all of I think I read it in three or four days I enjoyed it so much ah, to give a comparison I made it through Tress of the Emerald Seas in three days so <laughs> that might give you a bit of an idea. Okay, we have some more here. Let's see here. I reread Celebrating a Christ-Centered Easter by Emily Bell Freeman, uh, Seven Traditions to Lead Us Closer to Jesus Christ. I'll have to remember to get this out even earlier next year. Maybe do some of these. Uh, we were encouraged during general conference by many of our church leaders to make Easter as big of a priority as Christmas, at least in a religious sense. 
So I am enjoyed the ideas in here and look forward to fully implementing them or at least many of them going forward. Let's see, I also read the first of these four sacred plays by Dorothy L. Sayers, The Zeal of Thy House. So, um, how to describe this? Let's see. Well, this is a play about uh, something happened to the old church or cathedral. Something with fire, I believe. Uh, very tragic. But in any case, it needs to be rebuilt, or at least a major section of it does including some of the most important parts. And so this guy, William, uh, interesting that he is from France. Well, the other two finalists for this job are both from England, but he ends up getting the job and he feels he knows exactly what to do. And, well, can't say he is entirely wrong. He truly is brilliant at what he does. But, well, they say pride goeth before a fall, and it definitely does in the zeal of thy house. And I don't think I can say anything more without spoiling it, so we'll leave that there. And I also read Jesus is the Christ by Neil L. Anderson. Wonderful to read his testimony about Jesus Christ for Easter. And last, although technically it should be first, since it is the seven, since I probably finished this first is 70 Maxims of Maximally Effective Mercenaries. So if you have ever read Schlock Mercenary, well, they often refer to a book and quote maxims from it about how to be a good mercenary. Well, this is that book and it is hilarious. So we have um, an introduction by a scholar and by the author and we have 70 maxims in here and each one has some commentary at the bottom but what makes this especially hilarious as someone who is a very familiar with um, <laughs> Schlock Mercenary is that this is the annotated edition and I'm not just talking about the commentary on the bottom. I mean this is the edition that supposedly real life characters from Schlock Mercenary put their own comments in, which is completely hilarious if you know these characters. So, um, the captain throughout Schlock Mercenary, that's Captain, um, is it? Cap Tygon, that's right. He got this from his father, the General Carl Tygon. And then uh, I guess he passed it on to uh not sure what her rank is at that time. Murtag though. Then she passes it on to 
Sergeant Schlock himself. So, if you were to read this, knowing nothing about Schlock Mercenary, I don't know that I could recommend this edition. You might be better going with the clean edition in that case. But if you know and love the characters of Schlock Mercenary, then this is definitely the edition to go for if you're going to read it. Oh, because, like I said, it's absolutely hilarious. Ah, so we have Maxim 37. There's no overkill. There's only open fire and reload. <laughs> ah. And you have the general complaining about how his son quotes this one badly. His son responds about that comment then says the general is grouchy. The Murtag says that the general is old and grouchy happens. Then Schlock suggests that the general was grouchy before he was old. <sighs> what can I say? It made me laugh and if you're familiar with Schlock, it'll probably make you laugh too. Anyway, that's what I have for today. Uh, I'd love to hear how your reading month has been going so far. Hopefully it has been going very well. So um, till next time, thank you for so much for stopping by. Truly do appreciate it. And until next time, I hope we all stay safe and healthy. And as always, happy reading.